thank you. Uh, the presentation, the data in the presentation um, is drawn largely from my master's thesis research, um, which is local, it's homegrown research. Um, I hope you find it uh, thought provoking. So, um, obs obsidian provenience study simply means ascertaining where the material was uh, found and where the material was uh, entered the archaeological record. So I'm, I'm trying to piece together data on a distribution of artifacts, identifying the sources of those artifacts, the source material, and then telling a story about how it got from point A to point B. So the uh, thou a couple thousand, 2,400 some artifacts, uh, over 600 sites. I use least cost path modeling, and I'll explain that uh, a little bit when we're in that part of the presentation, uh, to infer either direct foraging or exchange routes, ways that the material moved across the landscape. The study area is here in west central Arizona. And this study area is at the nexus of other principal culture areas, uh, namely the Sanagua to the east and the Hohokam to the south, Patayan groups to the west and the Kohonina to the north. Now that map is not meant to represent a, a static distribution of peoples because we know that peoples uh, those lines are blurry, and I, if I could have figured out a way to blend those colors to make that map more realistic, I would have. I could not do it, try as I may. Um, so within this research, my study area, there are several, uh, or numerous, uh, sources of obsidian. Those would be uh, primary sources of obsidian, where vul volcanism, has manifest obsidian uh, on the surface. This area is underappreciated in my estimation in the literature, archeological literature. Um, I think that might date back to uh, when Colton described uh, ceramics of the Prescott culture as ugly. Um, and uh, they are Maybe in comparison to some of the trade wares, decorated wares of other culture groups, but they are unique to our area. Um, but for whatever reason, a limited uh, number of studies have come out of this area, published studies. Um, so it encompasses parts of uh, several national forests, three national monuments, um, and, and a lot of BLM land, state lands, and private lands. So the research questions I'm posing are, um, which sources did the indigenous people use in this area? Um, does that record provide evidence that they were acquiring obsidian through exchange, or was it more direct acquisition? And um, what other aspects of obsidian acquisition behavior might we discern from the archeological record, from the evidence? So um, the variables I'll use to address the questions are obsidian source provenience, and it's based on microchemistry of obsidian, especially trace elements, strontium, niobium, rubidium, zirconium, yttrium, and I add in iron and manganese, although most published researchers don't. Uh, they're useful for discerning uh, a couple of the sources used in this area, um, as I will demonstrate later. The quantity of artifacts um, from each source area at each site, that's a variable. Uh, the number of obsidian sources represented at individual sites, that's also a variable. The spatial distribution of those artifacts from each source area. And what are the procurement costs 
reckoned in terms of least cost path modeling. Um, and I used a cost surface, which is a compilation of distance to water, slope, uh, uh, vegetation community type. So this is the instrument I use to um, assess uh, the microchemistry. It's a, a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. Um, so it's an expensive little toy. Um, but it is handheld and portable. There is lab equipment that does this, but lab equipment would require you to take artifacts from a site and send them to a lab to get them assessed. The portable instrument allows you to go to the field and assess without removing the artifacts. I find that preferable. Um, it works by exciting um, electrons in the inner shell of, of, uh, of atoms. And um, those ejected electrons are replaced by electrons from an outer shell. And there's a difference in energy between those two electron shells. That difference in energy is given off as X-ray fluorescence. That can be measured with that instrument. Each element has a unique signature of the energy differences between those shells. That's how you tell what elements they are, what they, those, the fluorescence represents. So um, I compiled reference data for the obsidian uh, sources I knew about. One of the um, folks in attendance tonight, Ken Ogg, uh, helped me some with that with a, a, a little known source up here called Black Tank, um, which doesn't factor in heavily to the archeological record, but enough, a few dozen uh, artifacts, um, that were unknown up until he helped me identify that source with one of his collections. And so the, all of the reference collection work was done at the source areas with the same instrument that I'll use to, that I later used to analyze the artifacts. Then I have to identify sites for field data collection. I use Google Earth to find probable sites conducted over 200 site visits. I also used collections from several local institutions, including Charlotte Hall, Verde Valley Archaeological Center, the Museum of Indigenous People, uh, the NPS, the Coconino, Kaibab, and Prescott National Forest all hold uh, collections of varying sizes. So when I interrogate uh, a piece of obsidian with this instrument, um, it produces, or you, you export, um, uh, a comma-separated variable table. You can display it in Excel, and it looks kind of like that. What you have for each element listed in like that row and this row is the parts per million and the standard error about that measure. So uh, I told you earlier the elements we're most interested in. It's not all, uh, all elements. For example, silica would be a very unuseful element because obsidian is primarily silicon, right? Um, so we're using trace elements here, niobium, strontium, in pairwise comparisons, um, scatter plots. So, um, and these are from actual field data from a site uh, on the uh, Agua Fria National Monument called Pueblo Las Mujeres. And you'll see that represented with the red dots. So where the red dots line up in clusters with other colors, that's telling you the obsidian is from the same source as that reference data or those reference data. So um, two of the artifacts apparently came from Topaz Basin. And three of the artifacts look like they're clustering with Government Mountain. And you'll see that that's the case no matter which pairwise comparison you look at. So I did six pairwise comparisons for every artifact collection. So 
So those data are then compiled and tabulated, and then I put them in a flat file with uh, the location of the site and site number or name. Um, and then I array the data uh, spatially using, using GIS. So with that flat file that I just showed you, you can, you can, you can do this, convert it to a shape file, which boom, displays spatially. Uh, this happens to be a graduated symbol scatter plot, um, so or point plot. So uh, the points represent sites where obsidian artifacts were found, or the site of the collection where they were collected, um, and the size of the dot represents how many artifacts of that source were in that site. So I had to do this for eight different sources. So a scatter plot like that for eight different sources. But you see some clustering, and part of that is random. Part of it's because, um, you know, it's, it's a sample. It's not a comprehensive assessment of all obsidian artifacts in my study area. It's the sites that I knew about or found out about or were collected in the past. Um, but you see familiar clusters like the Agua Fria National Monument down here. Big cluster of obsidian from Government Mountain. GM stands for Government Mountain, by the way. So I did that with eight different source areas. And um, spatially array those data with the source area location. So that's where the Government Mountain source area is that black cross up there. Then I built a cost surface, because now you need to analyze these data in a spatial context to, to have a frame of reference. We, we call that a cost surface. And I did that using a process called map algebra, and you add up data, raster data, which means like uh, pixels in a photograph, in a digital photograph, that's raster data. Only these pixels are coded with values that represent either slope, so, oops, that was wrong, slope or distance to water or the veg community type, which is called ecological response units here. Basically, four categories there. You have um, grasslands and uh, chaparral and pinyon juniper woodlands and forest. Kind of simplistic overview of veg community type. Anybody here ever spent much time trying to walk through chaparral? Yeah. So you can guess that if, 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 if ecological response unit or veg community type is rated one to four, four is chaparral. It's the most difficult to walk through. One would be a grassland easy to walk a straight line in a grassland. Gives you some idea. So those are all added up. They're placed in a raster file. And then you query that data by um, the furthest point points in the distribution of artifacts from a given source to the source area or vice versa. And, and I, I used two different um, least cost paths because there are actually two different cost surfaces. One is more sensitive to distance to water, and the other is less sensitive to distance to water. Those who have lived here long enough realize what an important variable that is. But it turns out on the landscape, it's more or less important depending on the frequency of surface water which I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that later on. Um, so I picked somewhat arbitrarily, say, a dozen points at the periphery of the distribution, and I modeled these cost paths. And that's the result for Government Mountain, I think. So um, then I analyzed the, the least cost paths using a student's t-test, paired t-test, um, 
and ask the question, how many other sites does that line intercept, not counting the starting and ending points? How many artifacts from that same source does it intercept? And how many of all sites, regardless of whether or not they had obsidian from the same source, does that line intercept for all the lines for eight different source areas? And in this particular example, you, anybody here know statistics? That, that basically, if you have something less than 0 0.05 in this significance uh, column here, that means a significant difference. So that is a non-random chance that uh, the all site intercepts are significantly different than what you would predict like a straight line path. Shortest point distance between two points. So um, what did I find? Well, the people that lived here got their obsidian from nine different sources. There are more sources than that on the map. Um, but it turned out like Slate Mountain, Kendrick Peak, not important in the obsidian acquisition. Um, yes, and I think that's a, an issue of quality, obsidian quality. Um, but these are the sources they used to a greater or lesser extent. Now, Superior is all the way down here uh, at the head end of Queen Creek near Picket Post Mountain. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. It's a long way. We didn't see a lot of it in the study area, but enough uh, to tell you that the, most likely the Hohokam were moving that into the study area. Um, there are 75 sites within this out of the 600 plus that I studied that have um, assemblages with multiple obsidian sources. Those are plotted here. So this is a graduated symbol based on the number of different sources at sites. And you can start to see here, there's sort of a cluster. Um, and that swath extends between Walnut Creek through Metwash, Williamson Valley, to the head of the Agua Fria River in Prescott. We, we are in this group of dots right here right now. Um, I believe that this research expands our understanding of the area and how people used it. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, a least cost path modeled between the Government Mountain source area and the Fitzmorris ruin uh, here in, in Prescott Valley. I don't know if people are familiar with that ruin or not. It's one of the largest uh, Prescott Pueblos in the area, um, probably the largest. So um, perhaps not a coincidence that that least cost path which is likely uh, an exchange or trade route, goes right through a ball court on Wagner Hill. Right through it. That's what that blue dot right there, blue cross right there represents. There's a lot of obsidian at the Wagner Hill ball court too. Um, so that's an intercept on that line. Um, and there are a bunch of other Kohanina ball courts clustered right up there on the Coconino Rim. And then one down here uh, in our neighborhood, like Grapevine, um, that one doesn't have any obsidian. Used differently? I don't, I don't know. But probably, again, not a coincidence that you have uh, a route of exchange moving through a whole cluster of ball courts there where um, most likely, those are that's communal architecture. People were gathering in these ball court areas, probably like people historically here gathered for county fair um, to play a game we don't completely understand, but also to feast and to exchange. Very social sort of a congregation.
So these, these lines of interaction are social interactions. That's what I'm really trying to get, uh, get across here is that these, these are crossing these imaginary boundaries that we set up between these culture areas. They're not independent. They're dependent. They interact constantly, moving commodities and ideas and DNA across those lines. So some patterns start to emerge in these data. Um, and one recurring pattern we talked about already is this Walnut Creek corridor. Now there was a, um, a researcher named Dave Wilcox associated with Northern Arizona University. And he published widely, um, probably more than just about anybody else in the Prescott culture area, um, but one of the things he recognized in some of his research that actually that he did for the forest here um, is that there's a, there's a trail coming in from the Pacific shell trade um, in the uh, L.A. Basin area. The Chumash people lived um, moving Pacific shell into our area. And it's coming through, most of it is coming through the Walnut Creek Corridor. Um, well, if exchange is a quid pro quo, what was going the other way? Well, obsidian was one of the things they had here. There are other things they had here that were commodities, trade commodities. It's like argillite from the Del Rio quarry. You know what that mudstone is, argillite? They made ornaments out of it. Um, nose plugs cloud blowers, pendants, beads, because you can grind and polish it relatively easily, and it's red, red-brown. Um, so that's a commodity in, in this route. Could, that's outside my study area. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the question was, could, could, we, could we find obsidian from our area in the Chumash Basin. Um, I don't know because I, that again, outside the bounds of this study, but good research fuels more research, right? That's, that's one of the purposes of this. Um, so this is a least cost path here that admittedly arbitrary, but um, some research that I read about um, talks a lot about something called the Pollock-Quapi Trail, which is an explanation of how uh, whitewares, Hopi and other whiteware, little Colorado whitewares, Tucson whitewares, uh, ended up in the Prescott culture area. Um, they're coming from north of Winslow across the little Colorado River to a place called Chavez Pass which gets you around Anderson Mesa and then over into the Verde Valley. Um, so what I modeled here is Government Mountain Obsidian distribution from Chavez Pass, and there's a lot of it there, to Fitzmorris Ruin. There's a lot of obsidian there, too, a Government Mountain Obsidian there. Um, that line, that least cost path, happens to intercept some very well-known archaeological sites, including Montezuma Well, which also has Government Mountain Obsidian at it. Um, so it looks like, and the route also mimics exactly what the oral tradition says, which is that route went right by uh, Pine Spring, because it's a, there aren't very many water sources up on top there, and that's a very reliable one, would be important for that cross-country travel. <clears throat> so um, that was the pollock Quapi Trail. At the west end, we had the Mojave Trail. And what I'm suggesting here is they connect through, through town basically in the Fitzmorris Ruin area, it's the hub or nexus of this exchange network, um, north to south and east to west. 
<clears throat> this is another uh, least cost path model I did from Government Mountain source area to Chavez Pass. And this is where I'd like to illustrate the importance of that sensitivity to distance to water. The red line is less sensitive. That uh, cost surface is less sensitive to distance to water. The yellow line is the more sensitive, based on the more sensitive uh, cost surface. So what you see in the little blue squiggles are the NHD National Hydrographic Dataset springs in, this, in the study area. So, and you recognize Mormon Lake, that's right there. Well, there are some Pueblos out here, Kinnikinnik and Grapevine in particular, that um, Brown wrote about in his 1991 paper. And he was talking about these being like value-added production centers in Government Mountain Obsidian Exchange. And so they were taking the raw products here, making it into tools, either bifaces or projectile points, knives sometimes, I suppose, and moving them to Chavez Pass to pick up that trade route from the Palatquapi, bring them into the Verde Valley. So, um, and if you look at that yellow line, which is the more sensitive to water, it runs right through both those pueblos. So I think that the distance to water, um, the sensitivity, it matters. And on Anderson Mesa, it really matters because there's an extremely limited distribution of water, and it's all on the east edge of that mesa. Does that make sense? So I'd like to thank uh, all of the folks at the institutions that facilitated my research, um, including uh, Kylin, formerly at uh, Charlotte Hall, curator, uh, Margaret Hangen, uh, the Kaibab National Forest, uh, Peter Pillis, still on the Coconino National Forest, last I heard, uh, Dr. Rose, who is just retired as the Prescott um, National Forest uh, archaeologist, also Todd Bostwick at the Verde Valley Archaeological Center and Dr. Christensen at the Museum of Indigenous People all gave me access to collections for this research. And there are some references for those people that might want to read up a little more um, on the subject of obsidian source provenience, x-ray fluorescence, spectroscopy, those sorts of things. This reference to uh, Christopher Hawks here um, I found it fascinating that he's a researcher from the, an old world archaeologist, um, Europe, and most interested in uh, like Iron Age, Bronze Age of metallurgy. And he recognized in 1954 with this new technology called uh, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and those instruments back then were huge. Um, that they would be good for sampling metallurgical samples and determining where they got the source materials, where they got the copper, where they got the iron, etc. cetera. Um, and so he wrote about it, saying this would be a great tool for archaeology to use. So I, I added that in my thesis, thinking, well, since somebody's, we all stand on the shoulders of other researchers, all of us. Um, and so he's a pioneer and a visionary. Um, Interesting article um, by uh, Burkett on the Pollock Coffee Trail. And of course, Dr. Shackley, he's the encyclopedia of obsidian source provenience with X ray fluorescence all over the West. I would uh, like to entertain questions. Any questions you had for me at this time? Okay, so we're, we're going to give this a go. Um, I'll pass the mic around. Whomever has a question, uh, ask a question in the mic because there are, pe there are quite a few people watching online right now. And please don't turn it off whenever you relinquish control. Go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Oh, my name is Warren Miller, um, formerly of Charlotte Hall Museum. Uh, I'm just curious, did, did you come across any evidence of what the people involved in this exchange were actually carrying? Was it 
rough pieces of whatever uh, obsidian was available? What, was it cores that were partially worked or any ideas? That's a great question. Um, I, will, I will tell you that the majority of the artifacts, vast majority of the artifacts that I analyzed did not look like that example of that beautiful point sitting in a collection at Charlotte Hall. Um, I would say probably 99% of it was debitage, the byproduct of lithic manufacturing. Um, some of it include, were primary flakes, which would mean they were raw material when, wherever they ended up uh, in the record. Um, but some sites, um, there was a, a lady here talking about a site she was working on in Payson um, that had no debitage, no obsidian debitage at all in this certain excavated context, but a, a projectile point made from obsidian. So we know from other excavated contexts that um, the Hohokam, for example, they actually controlled different parts of that culture, controlled like vulture and superior, and they traded finished products, not raw materials mostly from those, including uh, decorated shafts on the, on the projectiles, um, which would signify the maker, probably the maker's clan. Um, so it's like a trademark, right? We do that with products today, don't we? Why were they any different? Probably not. Um, so um, a good question that kind of dovetail into that question is why would anybody in this study area need obsidian from seven different source areas? Chances are it didn't all show up as raw material. Some of it was finished product from a very distant source and some of it did show up raw. The uh, Americanites at uh, Fitzmorris were from Bull Creek, and they were all raw. Um, so, uh, and that gets into kind of the non-utilitarian uses of obsidian discussion. So everybody knows it's a tool stone, right? But it's a very unique tool stone. A lot of it's translucent, transmits light. You can see through it. Um, light will show through it. Um, and there is a dissertation out of California that is focused on non-utilitarian non uses of obsidian. And it suggests, along with a lot of Mesoamerican research, that there was something special about that material uh, beyond its usefulness in making sharp flakes or sharp tools. Um, and, and I find that very plausible. Uh, I did find at the ball court at Wagner Hill um, a, a, a Americanite, which is a raw um, Apache tear, what people call Apache tears, from Superior, sitting at a ball court site. Um, so I, I can imagine, I suppose, that that was, uh, a, would be considered like a charm or something uh, with, that possessed power or a social connection. Like that piece moved a long way. It would have a history the history of an artifact, who touched it, who got it from whom, when, where, those things all would follow that artifact throughout its life. Does that make sense? I don't want probably further than you intended with that answer, but. No, that's, that's great. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. My name's Carol Smith, and I'm a member of the Arizona Archaeological Society, um, Pace and Chapter. And I'm currently working with Dr. Scott Wood as a volunteer on excavating a couple of sites around Payson. We, um, is there a time arc that you were able to identify of when obsidian started to come in through those least cost pathways to a kind of a majority time when they were there? And then if it drifted off, is there a time arc for obsidian? I've seen research from Peter Pillis on that issue. And he proposed that along the Verde, that there was a shift in directions of flows from different sources over time. Um, however, there is, there are other published articles um, surrounding, let's say, uh, Big Bug Creek, the Mayer area, that shows uh, imported 
Obsidian, Government Mountain, among others, um, in archaic um, contexts. So it's been moving for thousands of years um, in, in th and through the area. So whether or not that my research was not designed to, um, to temporally bound those exchanges or movements of obsidian, that's a whole different um, uh, technology. Um, and it's not very precise. The obsidian hydration most uh, is used to date obsidian, and it has to do with how much water is in the rind, et cetera. It's destructive sampling where X-ray fluorescence is not. Um, and you do have to take the artifacts to a lab to do hydration uh, studies. But more likely, your question could be answered through focused research that would take um, uh, obsidian uh, artifacts from uh, chronometrically dated contexts using dendro or C14C or some other you know approach to stratigraphy um, to see if within different strata you have a different influx uh, of obsidian. Does that, did that answer your yes. question? Langen, uh, you mentioned there were a number of sites for, uh, for obtaining obsidian, but only a subset were good because of the quality of the obsidian. So what do you mean by quality? Is it like the stress fracture if you're making a knife or something like that? Yes, good question. And I, I did leave that kind of open-ended. Um, I think I said that was kind of a value judgment on my part because I had to sample get reference data from all of those source areas that I mapped. Um, so I've been to all those source areas and, and seen the material, and I've looked at the uh, artifacts, obsidian artifacts in context. And what I can tell you is, um, based on my data set, that uh, there are some of those northern sources north of Flagstaff, that Kendrick Peak, for example, that just do not show up in the archaeological record here. And they also happen to be full of phenocrysts, which um, are impurities, inclusions that hamper control. Um, so if the objective with your uh, source material was to create a large artifact, a relatively large a tool, sorry, um, then uh, you, you would definitely want a, a relatively pure piece of obsidian in fairly large pieces. That's another variable depending on the source area. Kindred pieces don't tend to be very large. Um, but neither do tertiary sources like Superior and Vulture. They're Americanites. Bull Creek, same. They're Americanites. You'd be doing really good to get one the size of an egg. That's a big one there at any of those places. Um, yet they use those sources. They're also very pure. Um, the tools happen to be much smaller from those, what a lot of people refer to as bird points very often, or moved in unmodified conditions like the Americanite I found at the ball court. Um, so uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a difficult question you pose. It's a challenging question. Um, uh, but I think maybe we don't fully comprehend how the obsidian was being used, what were those non-utilitarian values of that resource? And is there prestige or some other component that we can't quite grasp with making a big tool or a perfect small tool? Um, were some of those smaller tools more ornamental than functional? Uh, I, you know, I, I can't hazard a guess as to some of that. But um, so it is a challenging question to try to really grasp and a little outside the scope of, of, of what I was doing here. Um, uh, Stan Souls here. Did you notice on any of the obsidian that it had been heat treated in any way? And did you work with any other materials besides obsidian? On um, the first question, was obsidian heat treated? Um, 
That would be extremely counterproductive um, in, in uh, lithic manufacture with obsidian. Um, other source materials like chert and jasper, commonly heat treated here. But they're, um, the objective of that heat treatment, as we understand it, is to eliminate some of the interstitial water which hampers control, flaking uh, of, those, uh, of those materials. Whereas obsidian is valued at least in part because it doesn't have those problems unless there are phenocrysts in it. That brings in the wrinkle. Um, but you, know, you don't heat treat obsidian to the best of my knowledge. And it's very likely to uh, internally fracture if you do. Um, with the x-ray fluorescence, oh, I'm sorry, my name's Jeff Meyer. Um, with x-ray fluorescence, those handheld uh, things, you're just doing a surface. So how much does it matter both on the field rocks or in the tools? Like if a surface is a thousand years old or brand new fresh, or if it's been sitting in the dirt collecting a thin coating of caliche, or you know, how much do you have to be careful about the exact surface? Even a curved surface might be different than a flat surface, for example. Is that a big issue? You're getting really good clusters of data, mm -hmm. so you must must be working. It, it is working. That that was my finding. I didn't actually put that on there, but that was a finding. Um, it works. <laughs> Um, which was a great relief because I don't know what else I'd have done for that research, you know, if it hadn't. Um, but there are some ways to address the concern that you raised, and I did in my research. One is you can focus the beam on the, on the X-ray fluorescence. You actually set it to a beam width. Um, so if you get a piece that's highly irregular on the surface, like shatter, which is unusual with obsidian, but it happens, um, you, you don't want to shoot that very, very irregular surface, so you'd focus on a point that is flat. Um, also, dry wiping, um, um, and in the case of uh, specimens in collections, uh, Windex, um, glass cleaner, um, which evaporates and does not have any of those trace elements in it, um, is, is, is the clue there. I think the second part of your question was, do those trace elements maybe migrate over time or uh, leave, the, leave the material? Um, there's no evidence that that's the case. Those are very stable. They're not isotopes. They're stable elements in the matrix of the, uh, of the obsidian. Does that answer what you were asking? Do you ever get coatings like I haven't seen um, I haven't seen obsidian with that on it, and if I had a piece, I'll tell you a good example. If I had a piece that was a primary, so it had some cortex, which has uh, very often like a perlite type coating. It's a degraded glass, basically. Um, I wouldn't shoot that surface. Shoot the surface that's um, uh, more homogeneous than the than the cortex. Hi, Peter Sherman at Prescott College. I have a kind of a research methods question for you. If we think of the landscape that you were studying as a book and you're trying to tell a story with that book, and then so many pages are missing because of urban urbanization or whatever's gone on, or pages have been moved around over the years in various ways, how, how does that influence the story that you tell? I think I alluded uh, in my presentation to the fact that this was a sample of the distribution of obsidian artifacts in this study area. Only 600, a little over 600 sites. Uh, I have continued to collect data. And um, so far, the, the study bears out. Um, but it is not a comprehensive analysis of all obsidian from all sources in the study area, even in this relatively small study area. Um, however, I think by testing those um, line intercepts the way I did, and the, you know, an interception was 
defined, you know, in my study is it was the line come within 200 meters, I think, of the uh, of the of a site, and a site was a point, not the whole polygon. So it was really a conservative estimate of how many sites are intercepted, and those are only the known sites. I think I, I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands, of undocumented sites out there, and I think that some of the lines that I dismissed as being not significantly better than uh, a straight line, which is absurd, of course. No, nobody travels in a straight line. Um, that um, that it would probably uh, include more of those routes that I dismissed with a more comprehensive data set. Am I getting to the question you're asking? Another way to look at it would be the converse, right? Let's say, okay, so now we have these suggested least cost paths for one commodity. Why not design some um, subsequent research based on those data that say how much of those lines have already been surveyed? So do we really know the distribution of sites along these paths? Um, there is some literature from the old country where they were doing least cost math modeling and then designing survey strategies based on those least cost paths and finding, lo and behold, yes, there are many, many, many sites along these routes. I think that if we really had the funding and the time and the interest to pursue it that way, we would fill in some of those blanks. Is that better get her to your question? No longer discernible. discernible right. I understand your point, and, and it's well made. Yes, there's development, there's disturbance, um, there's accessibility issues on on certain lands where you just can't go there, um, and and determine whether there's there's more data to be collected there or not. Um, so a, a lot of unknowns there. Um, is it a comprehensive story of exchange in the Prescott culture area? No, but I think it informs the bigger picture which, with commodity exchange, uh, knowing the resources, we local resources that were integrated in the network, the uh, commodities that were traded in and through the area, um, be that you know shell from the coast, argillite from Del Rio area, obsidian from a variety of sources, trade wares from a variety of sources. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we're, 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 it's blurry, but we're getting a clearer picture of how people were moving goods through this landscape. We have time for one more question. I think Michael will <coughs> hang out and, and chat afterwards. Absolutely. How about from this side of the room? We've been, here we go. Joe Robertson, um, Hi, Joe. did you have any uh, uh, sampled material that that came from further out of the source areas uh, that you were able to identify uh, from, say, either New Mexico or Mexico or, or or some other source that didn't make the study or was was set aside from the study? I, th I think I understand the question. <laughs> did I leave anything out? Did you leave anything did I find, out? <laughs> did I find something and go, wow. You know, 2,400 some artifacts I get. This one I don't. Um, no, I did not. Um, and that was something of a surprise. Now, I'll tell you that Mr. Og, who is in the audience today, helped me with identify the source of about a dozen uh, artifacts that were in that category before I finished the study. Um, happened to have a collection from that source area that I didn't even know about. That's the black tank one. Um, and and it's, a, um, it's a very unusual source area. It's a blended red and black obsidian. 
not mahogany and black, red and black. Um, and, or it's dove gray. Uh, and before that, the only gray obsidian that I knew about was Presley wash, which is common in our area. And it's local, the tertiary source is, the secondary source, sorry, is local. Uh, it moves down Partridge Creek and is in Holocene Terraces at the head of Big Chino Valley and all along Partridge Creek. So it moves all the way from the Mount Floyd volcanic field through that creek over time. Uh, and they knew about the, um, the secondary source. And my, my data indicate that they were actually used, focused on the secondary source, not the primary source up in the, up in the volcanic field. Um, I know I, I went further than you intended again. But um, no, I had, I had some help uh, identifying a very difficult source, which is black tank. Um, but I was able to f actually find that source area, get reference samples, and positively identify those unknowns that were in the collections that I analyzed. Great. Would you all join me in, in, in thanking Michael Keller? I encourage you to stick around, ask questions, visit our friends from Subaru, check out our gallery, sit around and chat, enjoy yourselves. Thank you for coming out.